Uh, thank you so much, uh, Semra. I hope that you can hear me. And I am really, really sad that even though I had everything planned to be there in Ankara with you, I couldn't. So let me just start by thanking very warmly the fact that I was invited to this event and hope that in the near future, I will be able to be there in person. Because while I am very grateful for all the technology nowadays that allows for these things to happen, and I'm very happy that I can share a little bit of what I'm thinking lately with you through this uh, Zoom talk. Uh, I am very aware that uh, math works much better when you are face to face. So hopefully there will be some occasion in which we can be just uh, all together in the future. So let me start with uh, a brief outline of what I want to talk about today. So we are going to discuss a little bit about Hegarfler homology to start with. And then I will discuss a little bit what is this double branch cover construction. And then I will talk about uh, a result that is work in progress with my collaborator, um, Daniele Teloria, who's now in uh, Australia. And uh, the first thing I want to talk about is this Hegarfler homology. And this is a theory that was developed by Osvald and Zabo uh, around 20 years ago. And it's very powerful. Uh, it has many variants, has many flavors. And I've been in many talks where people try to explain in 10 minutes uh, what is all this about. I'm not good enough to do that, I think. I've tried and I always fail miserably. So what I want to do with this is just really give you Hagar Fleur homology as a black box, but give you the properties that I need you to have in your head to more or less follow what I am saying. So the theory is developed for three manifolds. And the ones that we are going to use are going to be closed and oriented. The theory has other variants for manifolds with, for example, boundary. And then you would be looking at sutured flare homology. But we are really going to stick with the easiest version of them all. And if you give me a closed oriented three manifold, then I can give you what it's called the Hegart flare uh, group of this. Um, manifold, which is simply like for you to have in your heads, a finitely generated abelian group. And you can see that in front on top of this HF, I have a hat. This is again, because of these flavors that I was telling you, you have HF plus, HF infinity, HF minus, HF hat, and others that I don't know of. And HF hat is the easiest of all these versions. So we are really using the baby version of Hegart flare homology. <clears throat> So just to really put things into concrete terms, if you give me S3, the group that I am going to associate to it is a trivial group. And if you give me the real projective space and not plane, that's a typo, sorry for that, uh, then you'll get two copies of Z for this finally generated a brilliant group, okay? Uh, not all three manifolds were created equal, and there are a particular subfamily that works very well with this theory, and is the ones that are called rational homology spheres, okay? This is just a space that when you look at its homology with coefficients on the rationals, then its homology coincides with that of S3. If you've never thought about this, uh, if I gave you 10 minutes, you would come up with what does it mean? So let me just tell you, this means that the first petty number of your three manifold is zero. So in other words, the first homology is torsion. So if I give you three manifold and you want to know if it's a rational homology sphere, the only thing that you need to compute is H1. And if H1 is a finitely, it's a finite abelian group, then you're done. Then you are a rational homology sphere. Okay, so what happens when you have rational homology spheres? What happens is that your groups that you were computing, these uh, Hegarfler groups, split in what are called the spin C structures of your manifold. So instead of having a group and that's it, you have a group that it's filtered, so you have different degrees um, put uh, uh, kind of organized by these spin structures. So again, either you've worked and know what a spin structure is or not. Uh, there are many definitions. They have to do with bundle theory. You can look also at um, isotopic classes of planes outside a ball. But really for this talk, it really doesn't matter. We are not going to use the spin structures at all. The thing that is going to be important that you have in your heads is that they are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the elements of H1. 
So again, this H1 does distortion. So imagine that I have seven elements in my H1. Then I have seven spin C structures, whatever they are. And the Hegar Fleur theory plays well with these spin structures. That's kind of the bottom line that I want you to have here. So for example, if I look at the H1 of the real projective space, again, not plane, sorry for that, then that is Z mod two. So let me just index this uh, um, set or write down this group as zero one. So then what is the um, decomposition in a spin C structure of the Hegar Fleur homology? Well, I had two Z factors and I split them as Z plus Z. Of course, this is a very trivial example. And you can imagine that as these Hegar Fleur groups get more complicated, how they are distributed in these different spin C structures gets more interesting. But it's literally this you get some group and then you get it split in different components that a subcomplex work properly. Okay. So this is more or less what I need you to understand from the very coarse idea of Hegar Fleur homology, what just what it is as an algebraic object. But uh, the theory, very fast, was enhanced with knots. Knots and three manifolds, uh, I suppose you all are aware that play very well together. So if I get a knot, a null homologous knot in my three manifold, what does that mean? That just simply means that I look at K as an element of H1, which are curves, and it is zero. Then what I can do is I can look at the knot Hegar Fleur homology of my space and my knot. And this was introduced independently both by Oswald and Zabo and Rasmussen around 2003. And the point that I want to stress about this not Hegar Fleur homology group is that it's really all algebra. What do I mean by this? Is that when you add the knot to your information, when you're creating the complex from which you're taking the homology, then K induces a filtration. So all your generators that you had for your FLIR complex, then now they are filtering different degrees. All the differentials work well with these degrees, and then you get kind of an enhanced complex. Okay. But if you forget the knot, if you forget the filtration, you get the homology of the space that you started with. So what are these groups good for? So I'm going to discuss them a little bit and um, I want you to think, okay, that at least you are not going to waste the next hour of your life, but you're going to listen about something that it's mathematically relevant. So what happens? They are, for example, able to encode the Alexander polynomial. The Alexander polynomial is a polynomial that you can associate to any knot. It was defined by Alexander nearly a hundred years ago, I want to say now. And uh, the, this is telling you that the not Hegart Fleur theory is larger than what we knew about the Alexander polynomial, but it already contains information that it's classic and that we know and understand very well. Another thing that it determines is the three genus of a knot. If I give you a knot, this is a curve in a three dimensional space, and it will always bound surfaces. And you can look at all these surfaces and look at the minimum genus of a surface. And when you look at that, then you can say, okay, this is the genus of the knot, the genus of a minimal, the minimal genus of a surface that it bounds. And the Alexander polynomial, we know for a long time that it gives you some bounds on this genus. However, the knot Hegar Fleur homology, if you are able to compute it, gives you the genus. So this is something that's very easy to define, very difficult to compute because perhaps I can find a surface that is genus five. And who tells me that I cannot find one of genus four? The fact that I am not able to do it doesn't mean anything. So this gives you a little hint of the power of this theory enhancing what we knew before. And then there are all these results that tells you how much does it pick from a knot. So if you have the same knot Hegar Fleur homology as the unknot or as the figure eight knot or as some cables on the trefoil, then you are those. So it determines this knot. And even, I don't have the results on the top of my head, but in the last year, there have been uh, more and more knots added to this list, list of things that are determined by knot Hegar Fleur homology. And there's a whole kind of industry uh, working with these things. And finally, I just want to say one word about surgeries, because uh, 
you might be aware that one of the central theorems in three-dimensional topology is licorice theorem that tells you that any two, three manifolds, you can pass from one to the other by surgery, which is take away a knot and glue in back a solid torus. So we know how these knot Hegar-Fleur groups change when you do surgeries. So this gives you a very, very strong description of three manifolds and how they behave. So uh, what is today's focus? Today's focus is going to be the knot hegar fleur homology of a very particular space, which is the double cover of your knot, filtered by the pre-image of the knot in a particular spin C structure, okay? So this is the groups that we are going to look at. So let me just, uh, to make sure that everyone follows, discuss for a millisecond what are these double covers of S3 branched over knots. So since um, closed three-dimensional spaces are just impossible to draw on a blackboard or on our three-dimensional world, I'm going to take an example with boundary. So imagine that I look at a donut, S1 cross D2. And on this one, I am going to look at a very particular involution, which is very simple. Yes. Right, I'm going to run a skewer through my donut and I'm going to consider tau, which is rotation by 180 degrees. So what's going to happen in my picture is that if I consider a point on my donut, the image by tau is going to be in front of the other side. And if I consider another point y in the middle uh, on that plane that cuts, then its image is going to be just underneath, I suppose, something like this, tau of y. Don't know how much you can see of this, but I hope it's clear. So now I'm going to get a quotient, meaning uh, that for every two points that I related by tau, I'm going to take only one. So I get half of my donut that looks more or less like this. Uh, I had my x here, but I'm not done because of course here I had my blue points, and I still have that uh, this point here and this one get identified. So just as a picture, this one is the same as I'm going to get here B3. So this is a ball, a three-dimensional ball. And it has two arcs inside, which are these two blue arcs that correspond to these ones that I have here, okay? So what am I doing? I have kind of two ends that are circles of my half donut and I am just closing them. Like if they were two mouths that are um, closing, okay? So what I described for you in these pictures here is the double cover of B3 branched over the blue arcs. What is this language about? So if I get a point in B3 that it's not let me take another point that is easier to draw, that it's not in my blue lines. So this one here, which is this one here, it gets two pre-images, which will be this one and this one. Well, if I get a point in my blue arc, it goes to its blue arc and it goes to its blue arc. So every point has two pre-images, except on the blue arcs that you have one. So this uh, kind of very little warm-up exercise that you can do is kind of the model that you should have in your head for the double cover of S3 branched over a knot. So there's a space here, I don't know how to draw it, so let us just do something very abstract, which is this double cover. Within the double cover, there's a subspace, let me do it in blue as I had done before, which is going to be called K tilde. And K tilde is going to be by definition, the fixed points of tau, because there's going to be an involution tau of my space. So tau square is the identity. And for this three-dimensional space with this involution to be the double cover of S3 branched over a knot, what I am asking or what this means is that the quotient space when I do sigma 2k over tau, if you want, so I am going to take one point for each two that I have related by tau, this is going to be homeomorphic to the three sphere. So let me just draw the three sphere like an S2. So this one now is my picture for S3. And then there's going to be a knot here, which is going to be K. And K is going to be defined as K tilde 
the class of k tilde inside that space, okay? So you have a three-dimensional space with an involution. When you quotient, you get S3, and the fixed points upstairs is the pre-image of your node, and the image in this quotient of those fixed points is your node. So this is how they work. Uh, and I want you to have, again, in your head, some very little facts uh, about these uh, double branch covers. The first thing that I want you to know is that they are uniquely determined by your knot. There's a very, very easy algorithm to do this. So if you were in this area of maths kind of working, then I will just explain to you how to do this. Computers can do it. So it's, it's kind of easy and very hands-on. The other thing is that these double covers of S3 branch over a knot are always rational homology spheres. But remember, these are the three-dimensional spaces that work best with the Hegart Fleur theory because they allow for this uh, separation in spin structures. Then, and this, again, if you don't know much about spin structures, I understand that it's a complete black box, but it's a very important point for later. So among the spin C structures, so these ones here, there's one that is a spin, not spin C. And this one is kind of special. And if you are the double cover of S3 branched over a knot, then there's a unique spin C structure. And if you remember, the spin C structures were in one correspondence with the elements of H1, but these ones here are not a group. But now that I have a special one, I can decide that that one is going to correspond to the zero. And this is going to allow me to organize my spin C structures in a very intelligent and algebraically interesting way. So let me just, uh, oh, sorry, before going to one example, I wanted to tell you too that this involution on this double cover, which is going to be very important, plays very well with this spin C structures. So the spin is the only one that it's invariant. And then I am going to write my spin C structures as my spin and something, and tau just changes the something. So getting very concrete, what do I mean? If my H1 is, say, Z7, so I have seven elements in H1, so I have seven spin C structures, then what I'm going to do is, okay, zero is my spin structure, and then the elements of Z7, I am going to write at them as plus minus one, plus minus two, plus minus three, and then my spin C structures will be the spin one, plus or minus one is going to be the label that I'm going to give them, plus or minus two and plus or minus three, okay? So in the double cover of S3 branched over a knot, there's a very easy language to put on that works well with spin structures and my involution. So I've talked with you about two groups. One is the knot flare homology of S3 and a knot, and the other one seems more complicated. It's the knot flare homology of a space that we take from the knot, the pre-image and a spin structure. And you could very well tell me, hey, what's the difference? Why do I want to go to this kind of more complicated world to the right-hand side? If perhaps everything that I could ever dream of knowing about a knot, it's on the left-hand side. So the answer to this is alternating knots. So what's an alternating knot? An alternating knot, it's a knot that when I go over it, I go over crossing, under crossing, over crossing, under crossing, over crossing, under crossing, okay? Like that one that I've drawn there. Uh, you can draw it kind of wrong if you want, meaning that say that I am trying to do again my trefoil and I am going to do something a bit ridiculous here and I'm going to do like this. So I've taken my finger and I've pushed this one inside and I've got this. So this is an non-alternating projection of an alternating knot. But for knots to be alternating, you just need that there exists one projection with this property, okay? So alternating knots are kind of a niche thing between the knots. If I fix the number of crossings, say it's 20 million, and I look at all knots with 20 million crossings, and I look how many of them are alternating, there will be very few. The ratio of alternating of n crossings to total number of knots with n crossings goes to zero. However, they are very, very, very studied because many things work very well for these knots. 
So if you look at the Hegar Fleur theory and you want to understand something about a knot, at the very beginning, when we didn't have these filtrations by the knots, the group that you would look at would be the Hegar Fleur groups of the double cover of the knot, because this one is determined by the knot. And what happens? That this is always, always the same for an alternating knot. It just tells you what's the order of the first homology of this covering, which has a name. It's called the, the determinant of the knot. And hey, this is so much easier to compute than this. So you'll never use Hegar Fleur homology to compute this thing. So then when we get the filtration with the knots, you can say, okay, what happens with the knot Hegar Fleur homology of an alternating knot? And what happens here is that it's determined by the Alexander polynomial, which is a polynomial that, as I was telling you, has a hundred years old in T plus or minus one and the signature, which is an integer. And just like before, these things here, the Alexander polynomial and the signature are so much easier to compute and to define than this, that for the moment, it seems that hegar fleur homology kind of should not be used to study alternating knots. It's not really giving you anything that you can actually get new that you didn't know before with easier invariants. So the hope at this point is, is there anything in these groups here that of course are more complicated, but perhaps we get something out of them from the perspective of uh, the Hegar Fleur and com combining with alternating knots. So some results on these lines. The first person that looked at this um, setup is uh, Elisenda Grisby in 2006. And she was looking at two bridge knots. Two bridge knots are a subset of the alternating ones. They are characterized by having lens spaces as double covers. And lens spaces are very particularly easy to use three-dimensional spaces. So it's, it really, what she did only works for two bridge knots but she was able to show the following. On the one hand, that if you look at these complicated groups in the particular spin structure that I was telling you, the one that it's S0, the one that we like more than the others, then you recover the not Hegar Fleur homology of your knot. So one can look at this and say, hey, the glass is half full or half empty. So it's half empty if I decide, okay, I know that this one here is determined by the Alexander polynomial and the signature, so all this endeavor is uh, dead. However, what Elisenda is really telling us is that this spin structure has all the information that we knew before. So what happens with the other spin C structures? Perhaps there's more information that we don't know how to um, take yet. And that's exactly what she showed that you can find two different two bridge knots, K1 and K2, with the same Hegar Fleur knot homology. And that is very easy. They just need to have the same determinant and the same signature, no, sorry, the same uh, Alexander polynomial and the same signature. And that is very easy to find. But however, their uh, not Hegar Fleur homology, the complicated one, the one of the double cover is different. And what's happening is exactly what I was hinting before. There's one spin C structure somewhere that distinguishes them. So these were the first results in this direction. And then we have Levine in 2008, who was able to compute these groups for what are called three bridge knots with less or equal than 11 crossings. So why did I want to bring this one up? Uh, one first thing is that three bridge knots are very poorly understood. If I give you a knot and I ask you if it's a three bridge knot or not, it's very difficult to tell. And then the limitation of less than or equal 11 crossing is because he's using a computer program to do all this. So my stress here is that it is difficult to compute these objects. We know the definition of the theory, we know what we have to do, but it's not easy to actually get your hands on and do some computations. So the last result that I want to uh, mentioned today before going into my own work is by Alfieri Celoria, who's my collaborator on Stip Sheets, and it's from 2021. And uh, they were able to compute these groups for alternating torus knots. So those, I'm going to call them T2P, 
they, define, they are defined with a parameter P, which is an odd number, and they look like the diagram that you have in front of your eyes. So you have an odd number of half crossings. You need it to be odd so that there's just one component and that you have an odd. And uh, what they were able to compute was the Hegar not Fleur groups, but now compared with Levine and compared with Elisenda, you have it in all these spin um, C structures, okay? And they did, what they did is to me fascinating and we don't really understand up to what extent this is um, kind of something that can be generalized, but I want you to try to understand what it says in here. So imagine that I uh, get rid of the H, so for a millisecond, let us assume that I am doing this. So then this is recovering what we already knew because these knots are two bridge knots. So Ellie tells us, if you are looking only at the spin structure, you just get the same as you would get as if you look at the knot. But now say that we are looking at H equal one. So what we are saying is that in the spin C structure, S zero plus one, we get the hegard fleur knot homology of S3 and another knot, which is the T2 P minus two. And who is this knot? Who is T2 P minus two? So if you look at my picture here and you look at a crossing and you undo the crossing or you change the crossing. So let me try to do it live and not destroy the picture. So this one, I'm trying to do it the other way around. And then the other three are going to be the same. So when I change one crossing, here I've changed one crossing. What happens is that, is that actually two crossing gets deleted and you get this. So this result of uh, Alteri, Taylor and Stipschitz is telling us finally what is happening in these other spin structures that we had no idea of what was happening. It seems that we recover information of what happens with our knot when we undo crossings. It, this is happening at least for these classes of knots. And this is exactly where I am working right now with Teloria, trying to understand all these things. And to put it like for this talk in one topic, so that, that I'm just opening the door to what we are trying to understand, but I'm closing it again immediately and telling you that I want to study the following conjecture which says that if you have an alternating knot, so all these ones that we've been discussing, then Ellie's result, oops, sorry, Ellie's result about what happens in the spin structure is actually true for all the alternating knots. So we want to show that in the double cover, the Hegard knot flare homology in the spin structure coincides always with the knot Hegard flare homology of the knot. Mm, so I want to tell you a little bit of what we're trying to do. And I realize that I speak fast and say many things and that I am not there. But if anyone has any questions or wants to interrupt me, I'm more than happy to take any questions. Um, so let me tell you what are we doing in this context. Uh, on the one hand, we have developed a new computational approach with an uh, easy depends on what you call EC algorithm, but we have a computer program and we can uh, compute these groups for all the spin C structures for many classes of knots. If you give me a bit of time, what do I mean by this? We have, there is complete result for twist knots. Twist knots are very similar to this uh, alternating torus knot. So you have a column like this, but then when you come to the other side, you put a clasp. So, any knot like this with P and arbitrary parameter, I can tell you what are these groups. Uh, pretzel knots are even more interesting from our perspective. So pretzel knots, you take three columns of crossings. They can be positive or negative. You have to be a bit careful on how many crossings you put in each because you want that the result be a knot, but you can think a little bit about it and you will figure out what are the conditions. So that's a pretzel knot. And why do I like pretzel knots? Among other things, because they are not two bridge knots. So these are not included in Ellie's results. And actually, if you give me your favorite knot, which will be something like this, then I think I can compute it because no one's favorite knot has 3 million crossings. So it's not that I can compute 
everything, but if you give me something reasonable with a piece of paper and a computer, I can give you those groups. And uh, what it's uh, our work in progress is to try to prove this conjecture. So the idea and approach that we have is extremely naive. We want to compare this group HFK blah blah with the group, let me just write it here, HFK S3K. So we want to compare these two groups computationally. So we want to make sure that we understand them so well that we can compute them in a very similar way, hoping that at the end we will be able to say, hey, if I compute this, I have to do these steps. If I compute that, I have to do these steps, and the result is the same. So um, how does the computation go? Of course, at this point that you have kind of the theory and the aim of what we are doing, I need to tell you um, a little bit, if you want to understand at least the flavor of the math that we are doing, what are the details in here? So in general, we are talking about three manifolds, okay? And all three manifolds in the world that are closed have this, the composition. You have one zero handle, which is a ball, B3. This is my zero handle. A bunch of one handles that I am calling N, the number that I have, and I'm going to draw two. So this is one handle, and this is another one handle. So this is the union of these parts. And what happens is that if you want by Poincaré duality, by handle theory and upside down um, handles, the three handles and the two handles have exactly the same picture. You need the same number of two handles as one handles if you want this to be a closed manifold. And what you're going to do is that you have two what are called handle bodies. And this, as I'm saying, is true for every three-dimensional space. So all the information on how to create a three-manifold is in here. How do you glue these two things? So that's the only information that I need to give you to describe a three-manifold. I need to give you this N, which in my case is two. I have two handles. And then I need to tell you how to glue those two objects. So the two objects are going to be glued along a surface and the surface will have a certain genus, which is exactly that N. So in my case, it would look like this. So this is what it's called a Hegard surface, which is the same Hegard of the Hegard flare homology, of course. And I need to tell you how are these two handle bodies on the two sides related to the surface. So in order to glue a handle body, you need to tell me where these curves go, those red ones there and those blue ones here. Why? Because this is all, of course, I am in a world that it's everything is continuous, like it's topology, but at least that's something we have. So if I tell you where does this curve, whoops, sorry. If I tell you where does this curve go, I am telling you also where a little interval goes. So when I cut, my handle body along these two curves, I'm left with a ball. And there's only one way to glue a ball. The mapping class group of S2 and blah, blah, results that people know, there's only one way to glue that. So the only choices is where these curves go, and then all the rest has to follow. So where do they go? Well, they go wherever the hell I want, more or less, because I have complete freedom. Every three manifold is done like this. So depending on what are my choices, I'll get all three manifolds. So for example, I'm going to draw my red curves like this. They cannot intersect each other because they are coming from a world where they didn't intersect. So I just have to, at least, there are some very little rules of what has to happen. And the blue curves have nothing to do with the red curves. So I'm going to put one here, for example. And I always try to at least do something slightly fancier than just a very ridiculous curve, but then I always mess up the pictures. The thing is that the pictures are difficult to draw, but you could do whatever. You can enroll your curves as much as you want and whatnot. So this object in the middle, this one here, which is a surface, surface, not a handle body. This one is two dimensional. So let me stress this point. This is a three dimensional object. This is a three dimensional object. And this is a two dimensional object. So that surface with those curves is a Hegar diagram. So this is a Hegar diagram. So it's a surface with a bunch of red curves 
that are normally called alpha curves and a bunch of blue curves that are called beta curves and that tell us how these two handle bodies are going to be glued together. So all three-dimensional objects can be described by a surface and a bunch of curves. And what is the relationship with this Hegard Fleur homology? So I'm not going to go into the very nitty gritty details because I think that I will lost everyone. But what I need you to know and have in your heads is that the intersection points between the blue curves and the red curves. So this dot there, this is a generator of the flare complex of the three manifold that it's defined by that, okay? So in order to compute Hagar flare homology, you have a three manifold, you find a Hagar diagram, you find your alpha and your beta curves, they will intersect in points and those are going to be your generators. And then the differentials are very complicated. But this is kind of the geometric intuition uh, behind everything. Um, so, of course, if I wanted to tell you kind of all the details from now on, on what are Daniela and myself trying to do, I'll just get you completely lost. But I didn't want to leave all this kind of hanging in there. So I'm going to try to walk you through something that is very, very hands-on and hopefully will give you an idea of what are the ingredients, what are we doing and how does it work. So I've decided to go for an example with a knot 5-2, which is this knot here. So I want to do knot Hegard flare homology, which is starts just like Hegard flare homology, but you have to add the knot. So if I want to do a diagram for S3, a Hegard diagram for S3 that has the information of my knot, I could start like this. I'm going to take a circle for each space that is delimited by my knot. And I am going to make a surface in which my knot is inside, okay? So that surface is this one here. So if I am doing S3, the only thing that I have to do is fill in that surface and fill in this exterior. So the first thing that I'm going to do is to fill in the exterior and I'm going to give you these alphas and beta curves. So if I want to fill in all these lagoons that I have in this space, what I have to say in my diagram of these Hegar diagrams is that, hey, I'm going to put a red curve around every single one of my holes. In such a way, if you remember the red curves found disks so what is happening is what I've tried to illustrate in this part. So there should be a zero handle somewhere. And then these red curves are going to be boundaries of these one handles. So this is going to be just all filled in at the end of the story, okay? So I am trying to create a diagram of S3 that has information of my knot. So for the moment, with only the red curves, I have this object here, in which the interior is empty and the exterior is filled, okay? Once that I've put the red curves. But of course, this is not good enough because in the interior, I can do this and this, and I don't know something a bit more complicated that goes whatever, and that's not my knot. So I need to encode my knot somehow, and I need to encode S3, so I need to fill this thing somehow. So that's where we have to be a bit careful and look, for example, at this region here. I want there to be a crossing. I want to force a crossing. So if I am looking at my picture here, my knot is doing something like that. And I want to force this. So I have all my red curves now in the picture. So now I can play with my blue curves. So I'm going to put a blue curve here that is going to mimic what is happening with my crossing. So these two go on the top of my surface and they are over passings, and then I'm going to go on the back of my surface and join them like that. So this is like a sheet of paper that goes on the top and then on the back. And if you remember all these blue curves and red curves, the thing that we have to understand abstractly is that they bound disks. So there's a little disk in here, in the inside now. And now I have my knot that has to go over on one side and under on the other, okay? So I'm going to do that for every crossing. So at every crossing, 
at the crossing one, I've put this blue sheet, at the crossing two, this blue sheet, at the third one, at the fourth one, and at the fifth one. And then I am going to add the meridian of the node just to fill in all of this. So my claim is that this picture here, the last one, that only has the blue and the red curves, this is a diagram of S3, nothing else. I fill in all the holes inside and all the holes outside, and I have S3. However, it encodes the node in a very elegant way. I can just put two little dots here and give you a recipe to get back new node 52. The recipe is you have to join the two dots first avoiding the red curves and then avoiding the blue curves. So let me just put them perhaps better here. So if I have to avoid the red curves, the red curves, I just do this. And if I have to avoid the blue curves, I go through here and then I am over, over, everything is good. But then now, oh, I'm going to crash into a blue curve. So I have to go onto the back of my picture and continue underneath. And then I go here and go over. And then now I have to go under and then over and then under. And you see how I will create my node at the end. Okay. So this is the diagram that we're going to start with for a uh, node Hegard flare homology computation. And as I was telling you before, the important thing are the crossings between the um, blue curves and the red curves, which I have highlighted here as this little excess. Those are generators of my not Hegard flare complex. So you can imagine that once that you've done this once in your life, you never repeat such a complicated diagram. The only things that matter are the crossings and the regions. So this is a more compact version of that. Each region has a label. Each crossing is represented here. I have the crossings in a matrix in vertical. I have the regions in horizontal. And what I am encoding by this excess is simply who intersects what. So for reasons that I don't have time to explain, I am just going to ignore the meridian part. So in the region one, which is this one here, it intersects Y2 and X1. That's why there are two things in the columns Y1 and X2. The region two, which is this one, intersects Y1, X3, Y2. So Y2, X3, Y1, etc. okay? So now we are going to go back many years. And this is where these all connections between Alexander polynomials and classic theory comes into play with this Hegar fleur. The observation that was first done by Rasmussen is that when we compute the generators of the Hegar fleur complex, we are doing the exact same computation that Fox did, for example, to compute the Alexander polynomial of my node. So let me just tell you very briefly and not going into any details that these regions and these crossings are exactly the information that I need to understand what's the pi one of the complement of my node. And there's a recipe that Fox gives you on how to compute a matrix like this one in which the entries of course now have values but the entries are the same as these ones. The, the same places that have non-zeros have non-zeros, okay? If you take the determinant of this matrix, it will be something like this. I don't want to compute it. It has seven terms. Um, you can compute the Alexander polynomial, okay? The, determin the Alexander polynomial of this comes from this doing a uh, variable substitution. The important punchline here that I want you to have in your heads is the following. The generators of the not Hegar fleur complex of S3 and my not are uh, points of intersection are points, no, let me say it better, are one, two, three, four, five, five tuples, are five tuples of points of intersection between blue and red curves. And I want one element in each red curve and one element in each blue curve. So I want one element in each of these rows and one element in each of these columns. So for example, the highlighted element in green is a generator of CFK. And that's exactly 
an element of the determinant. Pick one element of each row and pick one element of each column. So in this determinant here, what I am saying is that every one of these terms is actually one generator of your Hegar Fair complex. And in my work with Celoria, what we have done is kind of exploit this relationship to everything it has to give us. Because what Rasmussen had observed and when these things came out is simply that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. But the meaning of these letters in the pi one was not related to this. And that's the kind of angle that we have played in here. So just very briefly, because it gets kind of messy and I don't want to get you all lost in my final five minutes. What I want to tell you is how it works now from my not to my double cover. There's a recipe given by Fox again, that tells you, if you give me this matrix that has all the information about a Hegar diagram of S3 with your not, Fox gives me a recipe to turn it into a matrix that has all the information of a Hagar diagram of the double cover relative to this field, to this um, uh, not the pre-image of my not. Okay, so the important part to get out of this is that this P tilde is the one that has to do with H1 of my double cover, and that the involution that it's playing all around and that I told you it was important, it's also very well established there. So I have A and tau of A, I have B and tau of B. And finally, what I want you to remark is that if I have two entries in the first row, I have two entries in the first row. If I have three in the second one, I have three in the second one. And they are the same. The only thing that changes is whether or not they are to the left and to the right. And I can give you a very clear algorithm of how to do it if you actually needed to do it. This is, this is very simple. So now, if I am looking at the not Hegard flare homology of the double cover, the generators will be the elements of this determinant. And this time there are 17 terms, okay? So I started downstairs in my not with seven terms that were the generators of my Hegard flare complex. And now if I look at the double cover, I get more, this time I get 17, okay? And the important part here now is, if you remember, I wanted to understand which of the generators here are in the spin structure. And I wanted to say that those ones, the one in the spin structure will give me the same information as down here. So the next step is to understand the spin structure and see if we can compare them. So, uh, let us just look at this for a millisecond and try to understand how these things work. If I get a generator downstairs, which is an element of the determinant, I have it here in green. They are traditionally called Kaufman states, okay? So that's why I call it KS. So it has the name KS1. And I look in the big matrix and I can just copy it twice if I want. So I want in the first line, I want this one and it's element corresponding by the involution, which was called tau. In the second one line, I like the last one. And again, the one corresponding by the involution. In the third one, I want this one and the one corresponding by the involution. And you can see that this you can always do just because of how I've constructed these matrices. So for each generator downstairs, I have a corresponding upstairs that is kind of twice the generators downstairs. However, that's not the only thing that I can do. I can mix things up. That's why upstairs I have 17 terms and downstairs I have seven terms. And that's kind of the subtlety that we have to understand. We cannot mix any two Kaufman states that we want. We can always mix one with itself. And sometimes we can combine Kaufman states together. So the other two that I have highlighted here are the one in purple and the one in the diagonal that I have not given any other color because uh, it gets very messy. But as you can see, an element of the determinant is just is diagonal with ones. So in up here, I have an element in purple, which is the combination of the purple one and the diagonal one. So these are all these generators that I have to play downstairs, upstairs, and the upshot of all this, and I kind of have one minute before my 50 minutes expire. So let me just get you back together into what we've 
said about these matrices. So the punchline of this whole story is that we know that for each Kaufman state downstairs, the ones that we get from our node, there is a couple of Kauf we can double it, and that gives me a generator upstairs. So this is very easy. I just showed you that if you believe me that these entries in the matrices are actually <laughs> generators of the Hegar player complex, for everyone that I have downstairs, I have that one upstairs. So if I want to show that there is an isomorphism between what's happening downstairs and what's happening upstairs in this spin structure, this is a good thing because now I have, at least in the same foot, more or less part of the information. Now, if we can show that in these upstairs, we only have self-dual elements, and I have not introduced this, sorry, self-dual elements look like this. It's K is one, K is one, okay? Those are self-dual. Then the conjecture that we want to prove is true because we will have exactly the number of generators that we need. And we know just from general theory that this group is at least as big as this one. So that would mean that there cannot be any differentials because you cannot kill any of these elements because you have exactly as many generators as you need. So that is exactly where we are working right now. The thing is that things get very subtle and it is not true at the level, uh, so the result, sorry, is going to be true at level of homology. But if you do these computations here and try to compare the chain complexes, if you start with a diagram that is non-alternating, then what we want to prove is not true. So we are really, really dependent on the diagram to show these things. And in the mean, like in the way of kind of clarifying all this, we have been able to develop a, a, a system to make the computations. And hopefully if I see you again in a year time or something like that, I would be able to finally tell you why this theorem, this is not, no longer a conjecture and it's a theorem, but for the moment, it just stays like a conjecture. And the only thing that is left uh, for me is to thank you all very much for your time and attention. Okay, let us change. Any questions, comments? Maybe I can ask uh, Anna something. Mm -hmm, of course. In the matrix, uh, downstairs matrix, you made a choice, right? Before that. Yes, there are many choices made everywhere here. For example, in this matrix that uh, I am showing right now, you can choose the order of the R's, you can choose the orders of the variables, you can. Uh, we have a convention in which these uh, R's or relations are read like with those arrows that I have put, but you could choose another convention. So yes, there are many, many, many choices. Uh, of course, part of the result is to establish that all these choices are independent, mm -hmm. like the result. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other question? Can I ask you a question if i if i understood you correctly your results generalize the previous results right yes uh, exactly but, because we're... so my my question is they always restrict themselves to a certain family of nuts yes and what is if you can just briefly tell what is the difference of your proof with their proofs, why they could? Of course, so the the only kind of real result in this aspect is the one of Elisenda Grisby. And she uses two bridge nodes, which also these other nodes that I was commenting that were called these uh, torus alternating nodes are also two bridge. And what happens with all those is that, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say something that sounds weird, but it's just for you to understand, it's like cheating. Because since the double cover is a lens space, then you know that the homology of the double cover on the one hand is ZP or something like that. So it has only one factor and you know the generator and those knots, all of them have a very particular diagram 
which is not like the ones that I've uh, designed here, in which you only have one alpha curve and one beta curve. So you get your beta curve and then you just follow it and you know that it's going to go n times around that generator. Mm -hmm. So it is the proof is just kind of so tailor-made for those ones that when you change your diagram and you just accept a general diagram of an alternating knot, first, you don't know a priori what's your first homology. And second, you have many beta curves like this one for each line. So mm -hmm. they just cannot be put together. We've been trying to reduce our diagrams or to get kind of information from what Ellie did into this context. And we, that, that was our starting point because we thought that we could do something similar and it just doesn't generalize. At least we, we cannot use anything from there because the minute that you have more than one beta curve, her proof collapses. Oh, okay. That was actually my question, whether you generalize what she did. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay. I, I... Yeah, I, I, just, I just wanted to see again a uh, statement of the conjecture, if possible. Could you say that again? I listened very, it was- He wants to see the con statement of the conjecture, Anna. Oh, oh, yes. The conjecture. The conjecture is that, that for an alternating knot, it is true that the knot Hegar-Fleur homology of the double cover filtered by the pre-image of the knot on the spin structure coincides with the not Hegarfer homology of the not downstairs. And it is known as of today for two bridge knots. And I can prove it for many knots that you give me. I can just do the computation and say, hey, yes, these two things are equal, but we lack a general approach to say that those two things are equal. Okay, okay any other question? Mark. Okay, let us thank our speaker again. Let me have a 10 minutes break. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you so much. I loved to be here, even if it's only virtually. <laughs> oh, we, we love to hear you. Your talk in picture, we hope to see you here. We'll love to see you here. <laughs>